For GateRoll.net, I'm Chad Colvin. I'm joined by David Reed and Darren Sumner, and we're here today. Hello. Visiting with Mr. Ryan Robbins. Ryan, thank you for taking the time to uh, talk with us today. My pleasure. <laughs> He's over there. Here I am. In my Your favorite, favorite coffee, coffee shop. shop. Yes, my favorite coffee Where shop. Where is it? What is it? Uh, it's called Rain City. It's in North Vancouver on the corner of uh, Second and Lonsdale. I come here all the time. I love it. And it's yummy. And people come in and out all the time. And, uh, you know, you'll hear nice coffee noises and the shh sounds. And, but it's yummy. And I bet everybody right now is like, if you haven't had your coffee yet, you're like, oh, God, I really want a coffee right Do now. they have chai? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, they have chai. And they have really good tea here as well. And someone left the door open. Horrible. The only problem, the door's not in the spring here. You know, you get this. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in the business. Uh, was acting the first thing that you wanted to do, or...? Man, you know, that's a good question. And no one ever asked me that question. I, I kind of like this story. When I was, um, I'll make it as quick as I can, but when I was 12, uh, we, were, we were about to, we were going to sort of um, check out the junior high we were going to go to the next year, and this, these kids had done this, uh, this sketch, this little play, and, and this one kid in particular just blew my mind. I thought he was so good. I was like, man, I want to do that. And uh, I had all these sort of hopes and, and dreams, all these things I wanted to be when I grew up, firefighter, stuntman, or whatever. And I, I quickly realized that for an actor, well, I can do all those things. I could be any number of those things. So uh, that's when I, I really started focusing on it. And then um, I went to uh, uh, a high school that had a really progressive arts program. And I had a teacher there uh, named Drew Kemp. And I would turn every scene into a joke that you do when you're a teenager. And I would just, it was this really um, intense acting program that we were meant to take seriously. And I just didn't. I just kind of relied on like, <laughs> Whatever, I just like, ah, oh, I can perform, it'd be great. And he literally kicked my butt in a scene. He was so angry with me for not, you know, um, being truthful in the scene with my scene partner that he took over the scene from my scene partner. And we actually physically were tearing at each other, and yelling <laughs> and screaming, but staying within the scene. And it was so amazing, the feeling it was so exhilarating and cathartic. I want to do this, I want to feel like this all the time. And that was sort of the moment. And then I scrambled around doing lots of other things. And, you know, I was a circus performer, I was in a band, and did all these things. So I didn't know how to really be an actor, particularly in film and television. And uh, this wonderful filmmaker was a fan of my band and put me in a movie and kind of just went from there. But I, I truthfully started quite late. I didn't. Um, my first sort of professional gig till I was about 26. Okay. That's considered late? Well, I mean, for me it was, considering <laughs> I wanted to do it when I was 12, and most people that I knew, most of them that I know even now, started at young ages, you know, like, um, you know, at least in their teens, you know, and, and part of me wishes that I, I had started younger, um, but part of me is really glad that I didn't, because I don't think I could have handled it then. Mm -hmm. I was a bit What was crazy. that year? What's that? What was the first professional? Um, my very first paid gig was a TV series called Cold Squad. And it was uh, a show shot here in Vancouver. Um, yeah, and I played a character named Chimp. Yeah, <laughs> Chimp. That was my first paid gig. Yeah. Hey, it's you've get, had... Getting loud in here, it's a lunch rush. <laughs> Uh, you've it's had a good idea, quite a... Ryan. Let's do an interview. <laughs> this was my, it was my idea to do an interview at a coffee shop, by the way. You've had quite a few other credits within the Vancouver area, too. Twilight Zone and several other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah lots of stuff. Um, we've been lucky, you know, a lot of stuff shooting here. You know, Twilight Zone was good on Outer Limits, you know, Jeremiah. I mean, there's a, there's a list of really good. It's, it's funny, Vancouver seems to be a. It's like a hotbed of sci fi here. Mm -hmm. You know? So. Are you personally more drawn to the genre stuff itself, well, or do you I'm just a, go where... I'm a bit of a comic book geek, so that's how it started for me. Like, I loved comic books growing up. I still like comic books. And, um, you know, I guess, I, you know, the, the genre is an offshoot of that as far as I'm concerned. I'm definitely inspired by uh, shows and films that have that comic book fantasy edge. Um, 
But I mean, I just love acting, man. I, I like I like the work regardless. If it's an interesting script or an story, I'm in. I'm sold. But uh, you know, I do really enjoy this genre. I think that I have a, I think I have a particular understanding of the genre, which maybe is maybe that's helpful. So, that. We'll talk about Atlantis and Blade and Redeem a little bit. Uh, throughout the series, we're never quite sure where his loyalties are. He double crossed the Atlantis expedition, Coley out and Cohen. And uh, was he ever loyal? Was he just loyal to himself, or was he doing what he thought was best for the Jedi people? I think the thing with Layden is that he was loyal to his people. I think that it wasn't about you know choosing sides. It was just he just I don't I don't personally I never played him like he was trying to mess with anybody else. I always played him like his priority was his people. That he would just always do what was best uh, for his people. And that, you know, and, and whatever happened as an option to that or a consequence, uh, and is that he wasn't going to worry about that because he felt his people uh, deserved more. And, and so, you know, that was and his sister. sister. And his sister. Yeah. Well, one of the last times that we see you on screen is the third season. I think it was The Return. I think that's the last time we saw you was The Return. The Return, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was like kind of an alliance that he's kind of sort of built up with the Atlantis expedition at that point. Do you think that's something that he would have held, or do you think if it suited his own purposes, he would have ended up breaking that, like in down the road? I think. In, in, I mean, in my world, in, in my opinion, I think that he really liked that he would have liked the idea of, of an alliance. I think he understood, um, you know, the potential for an alliance, uh, what, what he could learn from them. I think that was one thing about Layden that I always thought was pretty cool is that he wasn't, you know, where, where, where Kolya had it all under control and he was better than or something. I think that with Layden's thing, it was like, he wasn't. He was willing to learn. He wanted to, you know, he wanted to absorb everything he could that would somehow benefit his people, you know. And I think that he appreciated um, those guys for what he could learn from them. And you know, and you get guys like Ronan. You know, we never really, we never really saw a Jedi that, that, that kind of presence, and you know, you know that kind of. And then Taylor and the kick-ass female. I think those guys had a lot. You know, to offer, but just a, I think um, an alliance in general. Like, I think he would have upheld it at, until it didn't suit him anymore, any further. <laughs> until he became bored of it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Uh, what are your feelings about um, basically the Jedi storyline and Laden in particular about the whole storyline kind of being dropped after? What I, oh, what are my feelings about it being it dropped? It did. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I, it's, it's unfortunate. I thought it was. I thought there was a lot of potential there. Personally, I thought it was really. So you didn't think it ran its course and there were more stories. I didn't think it ran its course at all. I mean, I, I know that they had. Uh, you know, I mean, Colia came back from the dead like three times. I, think, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like obviously it ran its course, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe Layden had. I don't know. Maybe Layden didn't. Uh, wasn't enough of a threat, or I thought he was really interesting. Um, I just think that when it came down towards the end, you know, they had they had developed all these potential enemies, and I think they needed to sort of focus on one. And I think the the most threatening was probably the wraith, and so that's the avenue they they tried to go with. And uh, I myself find personally that the characters that you don't know and you can trust or not usually are the most interesting. I, me too. I mean, I find those interesting as well. I mean, it's like I, again, going back to comic books, I, I like the I like the antihero. I like the characters that maybe one day they're good, maybe one day they're bad. They kind of have they have their own agenda. You know, I mean, I think like I, I find that really really fascinating. They don't have an allegiance to anyone, and I tried to bring that to Layden. I tried to bring that to uh, the, the Jedi people so that they could call on us if they needed us, but then we might pop up it as, as an enemy, but hey, it's not personal, it's just business, right? Like, that's kind of what I thought was interesting. Um, but again, you know, they'd already developed these other, you know, potential storylines, and when they knew they had to bring it to a close, I think, I understand that you, you got to tighten it up and, you know, draw, draw, fo draw your attention to one thing so it doesn't feel too scattered. Who knows what will happen? I mean, I know you know there, there's talk of a movie, and 
You never know. I still know those guys. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel the episodes of Atlantis that you did gave Layden enough depth in character? And are there any shades of personality that you wanted to personally put um, into him that you weren't able to? Like a haircut? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throwing it back. Um, <laughs> you? No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, there were some things that uh, I like characters to have secrets. Um, that's why I like Henry. It's, you know, I like, I like, I think everybody's got secrets, and I like to sort of um, have something to hide when I'm playing certain characters. And I presented in in my storytelling of Layden some secrets that I gave him and it would have been it would have been nice to sort of sort of see those a little bit hints of those a little bit here and there um, you know I think that Layden was uh, sort of looking for a queen so to speak I think he was you know looking for nub you know what I mean <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah I mean that would have been sort of fun to complicate things if maybe he Fallen for someone on Atlantis, and I don't know. That's sort of something that I was, I was sort of trying to, trying to disguise. You know, it when helps you figure out not you not know if he's good or bad. When you're a guest star on a show that you may come in for for a year, or like once once a year, something like that. Yeah. How do you negotiate your situation where you have an idea for the character, yeah. but you do you, do you ever feel that it's... How, how do you negotiate this situation where it's, it's not really my place to tell them where to go with this character? Right. I mean, who am I? I'm just the guy who comes in and does this, but I really want to tell them my idea for this. It really depends. You, you have to sort of... Uh, you have to sort of feel it out a little bit uh -huh. and see... How receptive the producers how are. The, you start with the director, how receptive yeah. the director is, and then producers and writers, you know, in Atlantis, they're, they're quite present, so... Uh, I was fortunate that I worked a lot with Martin Wood, and um, and he's he was quite receptive. And you know, one of the things that happened was, you know, Layden becoming the leader. Most people know it was supposed to be it was supposed to be Kolya, and yeah. Robert Davi wasn't available, so they rewrote it for Layden. But it was still written. The, the intention was still written for Kolya. So when I got to work, I was talking to Martin, I was like, you know. We've only ever seen this guy as a scientist. I'm not sure how it translates for him to suddenly just be this ruthless leader. You think, is there a way to find a, a middle ground? And, uh, you know, of course, they were very receptive to that. And that's how Layden's version of leadership came to be. And then in the, in the following scripts, that was more the tone. And, and, and then Layden became this sort of ambiguous, what is this guy up to thing? Yeah. Where it wasn't okay, so much. Death. Yeah, which was, and it wasn't, but I mean, you gotta think of it, he's just, he's a scientist, you know, he's not, he's not a general or ruthless leader, he's not any of that, you know, he, he, he's out of his element somewhat, and I like to show that a little bit, I like to, that, that he was a little out of his element and trying to behave as though he wasn't, um, but it depends, you know, I've done shows where I've had ideas that I thought were great, and the director's are like, yeah, no, just do your, do the, stick to the words, They're like, okay, it's, yeah, it's cool, you know, you just don't know, I mean, uh, and it also depends on the tone of the show. If you don't know the tone of the show, you know, but I, I did know the tone of the Atlantis. Would you have like suggested something for your character on Battlestar Galactica as opposed to like Atlantis, or oh, yeah. are there just certain shows that you get the vibe from the staff that they have this completely in hand, and there's nothing that I can do to suggest anything? That's off limits. On Battlestar Galactica, you know, we did talk about it, and we did try uh, certain things because what happened was. Um, they love the idea of my character, but no one. They, Battlestar Galactica had so many characters and so many storylines, and then here's this new character that they really like and they saw a lot of potential in, so they want to keep him around so that they have the option to use him eventually. They're just not sure where and what for. They know they like the character. They, I like. We all get along. I know all those guys. So let's keep me around. And so it's like, well, go from like resistance fighter. To bartender, <laughs> like okay, so how much resistance fighter am I, you know, embodying in the bartender? So we made choices, like just 
grateful to have a home again. He's grateful that you know, he's got a job. He's got a home. Okay, he's trying to get his life back on track so he can be happy. Yeah. You know, at least he's got a fresh start now. You know, he's off planning whatever. And then, um, and then there's the reminder of Baltar. So we did have to discuss that. And for them, they have all these actors coming up to them, going, "What about my character?" This and all the actors are very involved, and everybody cares so much about that show. So all the actors want to, they want to put their input in. And for me, coming in episode here, episode there, and I, I am equally as passionate about the show. So I come in, and they're just like, okay, well, they're, it's either like, yeah, go ahead, give that a shot, or like, you know what, let's just, let's just keep with this. And I wanted to be on the show more, so I'm trying to figure out ways to uh, get in, to like create something interesting. And when we did. Um, the first episode of season four, that stuff with Baltar, you know, James is awesome to work with. You know, if you remember the scene when uh, I'm telling him to go ahead and scream, and scream. In the, yeah, in the bathroom. Well, he was supposed to scream. And he, James just didn't scream. He just didn't feel like he would scream. So we're doing it. He wouldn't scream, wouldn't scream, wouldn't scream. And James and I worked very similarly, we were pretty intense, we kind of get into it, I mean, we were battered and bruised at the end of, uh, of that episode, but he wouldn't scream, so I screamed Yell that for him, <laughs> and uh, literally threw him to the ground. He's like, you throw me harder, throw me harder, between takes, you come on, you can do it. So I literally screamed, and I was so mad, because he wouldn't scream, I screamed at him, I threw him to the ground, and, and it was cut, and there was this like moment of pause. And he just kind of looks at me with this cheeky smile, and we started laughing. And then there's like, there's like, there's like, there's like, there's like that was awesome, you know. So there's those. And then um, when the girl was beating me with the handle, you know, she's beating me over. The, and Michael Reimer's directing. He's like, not so hard. We don't want people to think he's dead. He's not dead. You're not killing him, you know. And uh, so they didn't. I was never intended to seem like I was killed, but that scene was so intense. Everybody just got caught up in it. Never was sure I was dead. I was never meant to be dead. Because you know, I was like, oh, please don't kill me, Michael. I don't want to be dead. Come on, man. I don't want to be dead. Here. I thought he was dead the first time I saw it. I was like, oh, I don't want to be dead, man. Please don't kill me. And they left it kind of, you know, open. And then it was like episode 15, you know. Yeah. Like 14 episodes later. You know, I get the, you get this call. You're back on the show. I'm like, I know I wasn't dead. <laughs> just been dead. in a coma for a few weeks. Yeah, and not a scratch on me <laughs> when I came back. Not a mark on me. Uh, what similarities would you say that uh, Lane Redeem and your character Charlie on Battlestar we have shared? Um, boy, Lane and Charlie. I I I think that there was um a sort of un unflinching level of commitment. I think that they were both very committed to whatever it was they were. They, if they made a decision to do something, they were going to see it through regardless, you know? And I think um, I think that's something that they definitely both shared. I think that, you know, there's definitely definite uh, commitment, no hesitation. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. They both had family with uh, uh, troubled lives. I mean, Charlie, obviously, his son was killed on yeah. yeah, on New Caprica. Yeah, Charlie had the had the death of his son to deal with, and Layden had had his sister almost dying. And mm -hmm. plus, you know, in my mind, if he's got a sister that he loves dearly, I'm sure he's got. A, there's other family out there, so I'm sure there was a lot at stake for him. On the drive. Yeah, and you know, we never talked about Charlie's wife. You know, sure, his, his son died. And, or, you know, so I, I'm, I just always assumed his wife didn't make it. You know what I mean? There was a lot. Died in the attack. Yeah, you know, but he, he probably had this really great relationship with his son. And that wasn't hard for me because, you know, I have a daughter, so we, you know, started shooting that. And the, that the first scene when he was revealed that, you know, he'd killed, he'd killed, uh, the, you know, he was blaming Jammer for the death of his son. I mean, that wasn't too hard to sort of imagine that. That was a heavy scene, man. Shooting that was like, that was like the heaviest, darkest, like, just weighty day I've ever worked and everybody, everybody brought it. It was a really weird day when we shot Killing that scene. Jammer? Yeah. It was a weird day. And, and you know, uh, Dom's that probably played play Jammer, 
Like, I mean, he just brought he just brought it. And everybody was so bummed like that they were killing Jammer, you know. Because Dom's such a cool cat, and everyone was just so bummed. Like, oh my God, you know. Every time someone of you know any you know relative consequence on the show was killed, it was just oh no. D was a shock. Yeah, right. That was a total shock. And yeah. What a sweetheart that actress is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it went even. You know, Cat, like, yeah. Well, Candace, but even when like Cat got killed, you know, Luciano. I mean, that was like I wasn't there, but I know. I mean, every time you, you feel like you're not going to be on the show, it's devastating. I, every actor that I know that got you know killed or written out, or whatever, was just so bummed. More so than that. every of I mean, there were tear sheds. Some some actors. I mean, it was, it's 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 a, it's a tough haul. Everybody loves that show so much. Like even working on it, you know, it's just so weird that it's like over. Weird. Could you compare the uh, working environments at all between the two series, between Atlantis and Battlestar? Were there sanctuary and sanctuary also? I mean, is there one series that's easier to work on than the others? Or? Um, well, definitely sanctuary is by far the easiest to work on. I think um, it's a very, very much a family environment. We have zero ego. You know, there are no high maintenance people. It's amazing. And that's one of the rules on the show. Like, you, no one's allowed to, to be a, a diva on Sanctuary. And it's very fun and really encouraging. And everybody collaborates and participates. And uh, it's a really great feeling. Like, it is like, um, it's like shooting an indie film that you're really passionate about. It feels like that uh, every day. Like, I love going to work. I have a 5 a.m. call, and on most shows I'm like, ugh. I mean, that's crazy. But with Sanctuary, I'm like, up, I'm ready to go, let's go to work. And then with, um, also because I'm, I've been on this show since the, the web series, so I think that I've gotten a lot invested. Um, but, you know, Atlantis is always fun. It's like, oh, you know, you're going to go have a good time, but it always felt temporary. She just, I just never knew. And with Battlestar Galactica, it was just like, I was such a huge fan of the show. It was so exciting and... The thing about Battlestar Galactica is every day was so different because there is such a huge cast and everybody is so into the show and really interested in what's going on. I mean, they're, you'd be shooting scenes and there'd be other cast members coming by just to watch. And that rarely happens, you know. You know, that'll happen on Sanctuary from time to time. Like last season when there were scenes with um, Christopher Heyerdahl and Peter Wingfield and Jonathan Young, like Robin Dunn and I would go and sit and watch because... For me, those guys are heavyweights. Like, those guys are like unbelievable actors. Like, there's a scene between, there's a, um, a Drew at Watson scene, it's just like, Peter Winfield and Christopher Heyerdahl. And Robin and I were just watching, just like, man, these guys are awesome. They're so good. They're what was them so outside, of their, uh, outside of their test? Um, it was, uh, it, there was that, the particular scene, it was a scene in uh, Magnus's office. Okay. And they were discussing, like, I can't believe it was you the whole time it was you. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry about that old friend, and, you know, it's just, but there's just a, I don't know, those, and Jonathan Young, who uh, is back in season two, is just like, gosh, so awesome, he's so good at his test level, mm -hmm. so, but, uh, they didn't kill him. what's that? Glad they didn't kill him. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, he's great, he's great, I just, we just, uh, shot some stuff yesterday he's, he's awesome he's so much fun and ironically I don't know if people know this about Jonathan he actually um, toured and ha has a the play where he actually plays Nikola Tesla in this play that he's been doing off and on for years he actually toured with it he's won festivals with it he has a theater company that was founded on the sort of on the back of this production this theater company is called The Electric Company and uh, and this is all because he actually toured as as Nikola Tesla, so he's just a fountain of Tesla knowledge. And he always jokes with his theater friends saying, well, oh, you know, you think Tesla died. He didn't. He actually went underground and became a vampire. Huh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Go ahead and let, let the man drink. That's okay. Don't mind um, since the web series, you know, the, the show has obviously moved into its second season now. Does it still feel like an experiment in progress? Or is it much more found its footing? Yeah, no, not this year. This year, this year, it's definitely found its footing. I think, I think there were lots of moments last year. There was lots of moments of discovery, 
Well, not that it hadn't found its footing last year, but no, I know, I know not, exactly not being saying. afraid to try something. I know exactly what you're saying. Okay. Uh, last year, it was a lot of like, oh yeah, it's not that simple because we have to do this and this, or there was a lot of, it was never fear-based or anything. It was, it was never a concern. It was like, it was a lot of moments of like, oh yeah, all right, we got to do this. But this year, you know what? That's what it is. I've been trying to figure out what feels so good this year. The scripts are amazing, everything's good. It feels, there's a level of confidence this year. I think because the show... It's done well. It did very well. I mean, you know, I think it definitely exceeded expectations. Um, and then some. I mean, internationally, it's, it's like off the charts. It's doing so well. Uh, and then, you know, uh, in the U.S., it's doing, I think, better than expected. Um, there's, this, there's this sort of level of confidence and, and, uh, and fun. Like, yeah, let's do it. And I think... I think there's um, a willingness to, to take some risks, you know, like, you know, it's, man, it's action packed this year, it's going to be great, I think, I'm, I love it, in the scripts. The first season of any show is, is usually, you know, there's, there's some potential missteps, there's a lot of feeling your way through the, the, the new world that's been created and the new characters that you're inhabiting. We go back and watch old episodes of Stargate SG-1 and, and some of them just feel a little foreign to what the show becomes. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on the first season of Sanctuary uh, from that perspective, looking back on it now with, with a year worth of distance, uh, what it accomplished creatively? Well, I, yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, I think that it does take... Yeah, it'll be interesting, like, you know, hopefully we go a few more seasons to look back on season <laughs> one and see it. I know at the beginning of season one, it's definitely that finding your feet and finding your rhythm and making discoveries. And you're literally making discoveries about your character and your scene partner. You're making these new discoveries, you know, on film, right there, it's right there in front. That's what's kind of cool about the first season of a show is you can actually watch people make discoveries in, within a scene. And there's something cool about that. But it does feel a little bit uncertain at times. Um, I think that, I think it just goes back to, yeah, creatively, I think we're, we're a lot more comfortable with the choices we make. I think um, as an actor, you know, say you get a new director, you go, well, you know, I don't, I, just historically, I wouldn't, uh, I probably wouldn't do that. And you can say that now because you do have a history. You know, as before you go, I'm not sure my character would do that. You're like, well, has your character been in this situation before? Good. As in my mind. You know, <laughs> you know, but now you can make some really informed decisions and you have really great dialogue, really great conversation. And again, like I, like I was, I, was talk, I mean, I keep talking about Martin Wood, but he's directing the first two episodes and he's a shining example of that because he will, you'll have moments where you'll kind of want to go, geez, yeah, something doesn't feel right here, but I don't have a solution. So I don't want to go, hey, this doesn't feel right. And they'll say, what do you want to do? And yeah, I, I don't know. But with Martin, he's so intuitive, he'll be like, it doesn't feel right, does it? You're like, no, thank you, no, but I don't know what to do with it. You're like, all right, well, let's talk about it. And then we'll come up with a solution. It's usually something really simple. And he's, he's incredibly bright, you know, and he, he did this yesterday. I can't even remember what the scene was, but it was like, something doesn't work. You know what? Just do this. And it was such a simple little tweak. I was like, man, I can never would have thought of that. I'm way, I get way too heady about things. It was just so simple to him. It was just like, just do this. And it, it changed the whole tone of the scene. It was perfect. Exactly what it needed. And I couldn't think of what, what to do, you know? And he just, boom, he's, he's, he's really great that way. How about the uh, scripts on the show this year? Scripts this year are great. I mean, scripts last year were great, but this year there's something new. Like I think maybe it is the confidence. You know, we've got um, a, a staff of writers this year. Last year, it was Damian Kindler and Sam Egan having to write all the scripts. There's a lot of pressure on them. And we've got some new writers this year. Uh, I feel like the scripts are maybe more action packed. Definitely a lot at stake, you know. Um, the stakes are very, very high this year. Um, in terms of story, or in terms of story, in terms of character. Oh, okay. Yeah, just mostly in terms of story and character. And I think that uh, I think we've seen the potential that the show has. So I think we just really want to like it really exceed that potential and just really knock it out of the park for season two. I think we s maybe. 
you know, maybe first season it has to be played somewhat safe, but I think this year it's like, man, we see what we can do. Like, let's do it. Like, let's try to knock this out of the park and go crazy. And um, I think we we got a better understanding of maybe what the fans want to see. I think what the fans want to see and what we want to portray are, are very much on the same page. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm super excited. I've only read the first three scripts, and uh, I read the third script in my trailer, and I sent Robin down a text. I was like, I just read the third script, oh my god, it's awesome. And he's like, text me back, he's like, this is amazing, it's so great, and you know, Truthfully, he was like in the next trailer. <laughs> it was raining, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, last year on season one, you had kind of like the lead guest star status on the episodes. Are they upping you for season two to full time? Yeah, I guess. I, guess what? I guess you guys get the exclusive, huh? This has been. Uh, I understand this has been quite the bone of contention with a lot of people. Uh, me being the guest star. Um, you show up so much, you know. Why not? Eleven out of or twelve out of thirteen episodes. Yeah. And um, it's uh, not to bore you with the whole contractual thing. It wasn't possible for them to make me a, a series regular last year. Um, this year, uh, to my knowledge, yes, uh, I will be in the main title credits. Yes, I will. There you go. It's exclusive. Right here. You heard it from me. And if I'm wrong, boy, oh boy, I'm going to be pretty upset. More upset than you. No, it's good. It's going to be good. Yeah, this year they've got me. I'm, I'm in. I'm on board. I'm, uh, I'll be around. Yeah. You just recently started some charity work? Um, yeah, I, I am... Uh, a friend of mine, uh, an actual friend, Holly Dinard, has a wonderful charity called Caleb's Hope, and uh, I'm starting to, uh, you know, I want to support her in that, support her some more. We're, we're going to be doing um, a photo shoot soon, um, and uh, uh, it's a wonderful charity, um, aiding women and children in, in, in Africa. She goes to Africa, she goes to Africa maybe, uh, you know, several times a year. Um, it's a very important charity to her. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to help out. And uh, I was doing some stuff for uh, the Red Cross last year, and mm. I'm trying to get more involved with charities. Charities are an interesting thing, you know, when you're an actor or in this business, because uh, you don't want to jump into them. A lot of times, you want to make sure that you know funds are going to the right places, and you're not being misused in any way. Um, which was great about Caleb's Hope. I know it's my friend. I know she started this thing. I know how hard it is to start a, a, an organization like that. And uh, uh, I'm really excited for her, and I, I'm really excited to support that. Um, for me, you know, my focus has always been on um, children, underprivileged children, uh, and uh, children that sort of need need support and need to be uh, um, shown options. You know, ways out. You know, my. Uh, you know, my childhood was, uh, you know, was a little bit, uh, was a tough one, so I like, it's nice, you know, I want to be able to show kids that they can... Return the favor. Yeah, show kids. I didn't really, you know, I had I had a, uh, a couple of people in my life who, who showed me options and, you know, and, and that was helpful. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them and I want to be able to do that. So, um, you know, that's going to that's gonna be a bit of a focus for me. And, um, started on this crazy environmental thing a couple years ago renovating my house I just want to I just want to participate you know what I mean I just want to make sure that I'm doing my part even if it's on a small scale you know, if I'm if I'm able to it's one thing you know if you've got a voice um, and you're able to use it you might as well you know? but you want to make sure that you're using it for something that that whoever you're working with is perfectly compatible with you know I mean you don't want to well, I don't agree with what you guys are doing there. And, uh... and that's the big thing. I mean, it's true. That's a very good point. And uh, people don't talk about that with charities. I mean, you have to, when you're getting involved with a particular charity, I mean, I, for me personally, I need to do a lot of research first yeah. and make sure that I agree with everything. Yeah. Because if if we disagree on something, if I can't get behind you mm -hmm. on a certain part of it, you know, yeah, man, I, 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 there's just some things that are really, really important to me. And if, if I make... The decision to do something, I give it everything I have. So if I hit a wall, just like whoa, 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 that's not cool. I can't, you know. So anyway, it's it, it, 
for me, it's a bit of, it's a definitely a, uh, it would, it would, it would, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Who said I that? I don't have great power yet, but uh, I feel like I have great responsibility. <laughs> now that it's quiet again, let's continue the interview. <laughs> ah, that was, by the way, that was the lunchtime rush that we did the interview through. They are so gone now. Yeah. It's, it's almost silent. Aside from Sanctuary, anything else going on that you need to keep an eye out for? Um, I, uh, between uh, seasons, I did a, a feature film. I went over to Toronto to shoot a feature called Leslie, My Name is Evil, um, which is uh, going to be a crazy, crazy movie. Uh, it was, it's um, a, sort of an interpretation of uh, the Manson murders. I believe, I think the best way to describe the film is it's, it's um, the film is more of a statement than a biopic, but uh, I, uh, yeah, effectively, yeah, I played Charles Manson in a movie for a month and a half, shaved my head, grew back really curly, <laughs> go figure. I'm just glad it grew back. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh my god. Superstitious there? <laughs> That's, you know. Shave your head, you're kind of confronted with your hairline, and I was like, oh, okay, oh, not so bad, not so bad, okay. But um, yeah, that movie, uh, it's gonna do the festival circuit, and, um, and you know, I, I'm pretty confident it'll premiere in Toronto. That's what it sounds like. I haven't seen it yet, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, definitely, we all worked very hard on it. It was, a, it was a tough place to go for a month and a half, it was a tough place to be in. Uh, that guy's head for a month and a half, and uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I just hate about you guys here in, in Vancouver. You, you have so many great actors, but you know, and you do so many great non blockbuster projects, they're so darn difficult to get a hold of, yeah, without downloading illegally. No, you know, it's, it's next to impossible to get them, yeah, it's true. And um, I mean, that's just that's just the times, you know, people, people want to see, you know. Big Michael Bay yeah. blockbuster explosions with a yeah. Bruckheimer ex inspired musical score that guides you emotionally through the yeah. piece. You know, I mean, you can. I have this theory about like a, a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Not that I wouldn't do one, um, <laughs> but my theory is, I think you know he gets. I, I'm not even sure who he gets to compose his films, but Bruckheimer movies have a very particular music composition, and I think they'd be an entirely different film without the music and you've got this music that literally guides you emotionally mm. how you're supposed to feel like mm. you know and people get emotional and you're like I think that's the I think that's a lot to do with that music and it's very you know I think he, I think he realizes the importance of the score in, in, uh, in his films but I, you know I love those movies I'd love to do a big old action movie while I can I mean that would be so much fun those movies look like fun to make but that's what people want to see I think people want people you know, you're working 40 to 60 hour weeks, you just want to go be entertained. I get that sometimes. I just want to be entertained. Just, just go watch something that just makes me, you know, forget about everything else. And um, as an actor, I just like to do movies that have, I think maybe a little more intense, I suppose, or a little more interesting, more intimate, I think. You know, I come from indie film, that's where I started. I will always do indie film. You know, I will never stop doing indie film. And I'm really fortunate to be able to do certain projects, certain films that pay well. And, you know, I've done my bits and pieces in, in big Hollywood movies. And that allows me to be able to go work on an indie film for little to no money, which is often the case, you know. And that's the problem. It, it's really hard to get funding for an indie film, which makes it really hard to market an indie film, which makes it really hard to see. And it's, fine. it's interesting now, like, indie, in my opinion, has become more of a genre. It's cool. It's, it's like, in thing. It's, not a, it's not a budget anymore. It used to be, it's an indie film because it's a budget, and now it's like you see these indie genre films, you know, where it's... They got a big budget, but they're oh, calling yeah. it indie. Every that's major how studio yeah. has their own indie. Fox Searchlight. Yeah. Look at Donnie Darko. I mean, the explosion of that movie. Right, and now they're doing S. Darko. They're doing a sequel about they his are? sister. Yeah. Oh man. But even like you get films. I'm not entirely sure of the budget of films like Dan in Real Life or Lars and the Real Girl or these. Just, but I'm pretty sure it's decent, decent budget. You know, I don't want to. I don't know. But uh, you've got some big stars. 
but they look, they have a look, right? Like, I know, I know Juno is truly an indie film. I know they shot that film for like $7 million, which is insane. It's a beautiful film, and, you know, uh, one of my friends was a producer on it, and uh, he told me that their biggest hope was, they knew Ellen Page would blow up and be a huge, big star, but they had no idea the kind of response people would get. So you, you, do get, you do get lucky from time to time, you know, you do get that attention from time to time, and, and it's great. And, and now that indie is this type of genre, and Juno has so much to do with that, I mean, how many movies come out now that just look and feel like Juno? When Juno came out, the movie was so unique. No, nothing really... The, the, only film that, the only films that reminded me of that kind of genre were from, from like, the late, like, the 80s. Like, say anything. Now that John Cusack movie with the ghetto blaster, like those movies are being pop made popular again, which I think is awesome. Is there any kind of character that you won't play? Any kind of character that I won't play? Um, I don't. I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. I, I think it would really depend on the script and the, the message. I I would be really hesitant to play certain types of characters. I think that like you know first thing that comes to mind is like, you know, like a pedophile or something. I don't think I'd like that. But then I think of little children and Jackie Earl Haley, who is unbelievable. And it's just like, oh my God, I don't want to like this guy. But I, he's so compelling. I think of the overall script and the tone and the people involved yeah, how are, the are solid. Written, yeah. And how, yeah, how the character is written. I think, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quickly say no. You know? um, I love that challenge and I'm really fortunate to be an actor who uh, is given the luxury to play all sorts of different characters. You know, I, I, I aspire to be, you know, a very memorable character actor. I, I, you know, my my heroes are as we're famous now, but maybe more. You know, ten years I've been doing this for twenty years, and like Chris Cooper, you know, I think is amazing. I think Philip Seymour Hoffman is amazing, and then character leads. Like I think, you know, I think Viggo Mortensen is such a phenomenally gifted actor, but he's so prepared. He obviously works very, very hard, and I love the work ethic of guys like that, you know? You Sean Penn's and Johnny Depp's, like these guys that are just great. Like, they're, they're great big stars, but they could easily have, without that exposure, I'm sure they would still be making movies if they were doing them at, at these small indie movies, if that was what they were offered, I, I think. I like that. I like, I like that, that kind of intensity. It's not the healthiest way to be an actor, it's 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 tough. Like it's tough on the body, it's tough on, on the emotions when you wanna dedicate yourself and commit yourself to a character that heavily, but it's the only way I know how to work. So it's it's fulfilling, you know. I'm trying to find a way to actually become a werewolf. But, uh, that. Yeah, I just can't find any real ones. Actually <laughs> you go online, Craigslist, you know, werewolf to statues. It's boring. <laughs> Just to know what it's like. I keep waiting to see you as, like, as a full-fledged werewolf in the show, but it's so expensive to show you, considering how they designed him. Yeah, they didn't want to design him cheap. No, they want and, to make him look impressive. You know, it's really interesting because we've had this conversation, and uh, you know, when we did see the version of. Henry is a werewolf in the elevator in the Edward episode. That was Edward's interpretation of Henry's beast. That's not even what Henry looks like as a werewolf. Oh. So <laughs> when we do see Henry as a werewolf, it'll be it'll be different still. When we do see him. It's a little nugget there. If we do see him. <laughs> Backtrack! <laughs> we might see him. It would, might. it would be such a letdown. To never see the character. To never well, see his true form. Well, we know that Henry has some control over uh, his werewolfiness. Lycanthropy? Yeah, his lycanthropy. <laughs> his lupinopathy. Uh, he, he, so we know, we know Henry has some control over it, so uh, I think that there's going to be elements we're able to play. I think that, you know, we're not going to overexpose it. We're not going not to show it often. Because you know, I think it's. Well, I think it's well, also for a character choice. I think it's very painful for Henry to do that. I don't think he wants to do it. I think it's one of those things that it's like it's like 
the last, last, last Back to option. the wall, break yeah. himself out of a yeah out of a cell, out of a out of a meat locker. Yeah, I was bruised after that scene. It looks it didn't look like it didn't look that that tough or rough at all. But I was bouncing off those walls for the like hours. <laughs> you put it on your Facebook, man. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. I got a picture. That's my Facebook it's like, picture. Like, what is that? And then I saw the other side. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's my Facebook picture. I like that picture. That's a good picture. Um, that was actually uh, a, a fan created that picture. I don't know if you, Shelly, Shelly Templar created that picture. She, I was like, I have to have it. So she sent it to me. Like, awesome. On the Facebook photo. 